Uh, and thank you to all that are joining us tonight for this webinar. Um, for those that have never attended one of my webinars, I will start with a very brief um, introduction. So I have a background in animal and equine science uh, with a specialization in equine nutrition and behavior. After I graduated for my undergrad studies, um, I continued uh, with my master studies, which I conducted um, in New Zealand. So I traveled to New Zealand and lived there for a year where I studied racehorses. Um, but I was particularly interested in looking at the effect of dietary transition from pasture to grain feeding and vice versa on the gut health of horses and obviously how that may influence the onset of hindgut acidosis or uh, laminitis. And um, we've already talked about um, this subject in a previous webinar if you're interested to know more about laminitis and, and its management, particular pasture management. So after my master's I, um, I moved to, well first back to the Netherlands, then I moved back to Australia where I founded MB Equine Services. And this is an education and research business um, where I offer, well, specialized consultancy services in um, equine nutrition um, and property design, um, pasture management, as well as coaching. And, and I'm also an official for, uh, for um, Equestrian Australia, so mainly uh, in, in dressage. Um, but as part of my property and pasture consulting um, and, and ed education, I um, kind of founded the, the, or got the idea to integrate uh, permaculture. And that's where kind of equine permaculture was born as an initiative to kind of see where we could marry it together and take some of their principles into um, how we can apply it into the designing of our property as well as the pasture management component. And particularly today we're going to talk about how we can restore damaged soils and pastures. So that's where a lot of these um, principles come back in. Um, I also have um, a blog page uh, focusing on equine permaculture where we post articles. We really hope to set that up as um, an, um, kind of a community site where people could share their stories uh, with the intention, hopefully later on, um, to actually run online courses in equine permaculture. So an advanced course and an introductory course. And I've been saying this for a while and it will happen one day. Um, just have to um, get the curriculum happening and get the website up and running uh, to be able to support that. So watch this space and, and I will give later my details where you can follow us on Facebook uh, to watch that space of, well, when, when will it happen, when we'll develop the, the course as well as the manual and the books. Okay, so short background. What we're going to talk about today is about damaged pastures and soils and we already touched on this probably a couple of years ago. Um, but we're going to focus on, well, what, what kind of, what are pastures for horses? What are our goals? Just a refresher on, well, what are our main purposes? Then we're going to talk about common pasture problems, um, focusing on compaction. When, how, how can you tell that your soil is compacted? And then I'm going to just very briefly explain four ways how we can restore and maintain healthy soils. Obviously, there are many other strategies that we could discuss in more detail, but due to time, I restricted it to four, um, four, um, four tools, four management tools. But obviously, um, there may be other questions or suggestions that we can discuss in the Q&A, and then we'll just close off. Okay, so let's get started. So, well, we're quite aware that if we think about pastures for horses, we, we relate back to the the horse in its wild environment, so free roaming horses or actually wild horses. And this is a really nice picture I, I, sh I show in a lot of my webinars and in my workshops. Um, you can see here horses grazing in a group, an open grass landscape, and you can see there's different types of um, vegetation and they're all walking, eating, walking, eating. So we talked about this in previous webinars, so-called patch foraging behavior, where they're searching for nutrients but where they also may avoid certain toxins or eat for flavor. So we discussed this in the um, Pastures as Pharmacy webinar. So if you're interested in, in that, check that one out. Um, the, the, the pasture that we're, we're looking at is much more of a peri type, so kind of your lower quality um, pastures. And if we look at how we are currently um, keeping horses, um, we've kind of adopted the lifestyle 
of the livestock uh, livestock management of pastures. So typically um, only a couple of species, so-called monocultures, um, high productive pastures um, that are uh, reasonably high in uh, carbohydrates um, or protein. Uh, we like to also add that legume, so the rye grass with clover, for instance, is a very common uh, combination. Um, uh, for instance, in New Zealand is the main brine pasture, um, also in the south of Australia, but also in, in countries in the northern hemisphere. Um, so this type of green kind of consistent um, similar type of pasture is very common. But that causes for some problems because um, our horse is similar to cows and can they cope with that? And in my research, when I looked at uh, racehorses, I could, um, I could see that um, these racehorses were able to cope with that pasture, but that's probably because they were bred to and selected over so many years to cope with high sugar diets. Although what I found is that even though they were getting high sugar pasture as well as grains, um, the pH was reasonably low, but they didn't develop actually acute hindgut acidosis. That's when the pH in the hindgut gets um, below pH of 6, and that can cause, um, obviously, digestive problems as well as can maybe lead to laminitis. Um, but I found that in my population, because they kind of were adapted to a sugary diet on pasture, and when we then changed into a grain, grain diet, they kept their pH reasonably stable around the 6. So we kind of identified that these horses may have had subclinical acidosis, but they never really developed clinical acidosis or laminitis. So yes, in a population that is maybe adapted to that, um, you can say that, yes, they can cope to a certain degree with these uh, sugary pastures. But if you look at their strategy and you compare them to, to cattle, indeed, um, when there are, for instance, on a short herbage, um, and so that's low fiber, so that's typically these like ryegrass, clover-based pastures. They're um, low in fiber, but they're high in protein, and we see that cattle do really well with these pastures, and horses can cope with it. But, as I said, there are some digestive or metabolic problems that we may, may see in horses. So both of the species do well, but if you look at them, they're uh, the strategy or kind of how horses have survived in, in, in a grass landscape is that horses can do quite well on old dense herbage. So that is high fiber but reasonably low in protein. So what horses do is that they eat on a more continuous basis to increase their intake to get enough nutrition, um, uh, get enough nutrition in their body. Um, but cattle don't do really well on kind of these old dense herbage. They really need to have more medium quality, um, a medium or high quality forage. Um, that's because they, they stop and they uh, regurgitate and so they don't eat on a continuous basis. Um, so they need to have much more what we call nutrient dense meals um, where the horses can do much better on these kind of um, rougher pastures, these kind of older, old uh, dense, uh, kind of more uh, stemmy pastures uh, compared to to um, to cattle. If you look at how they evolved, but obviously, um, as I said, horses have been adapted over or have been selected for breeding and have adapted to um, our livestock systems um, to a certain degree. Obviously, if we then look at pony breeds or good doer breeds like your Spanish or your Lusitanos or even your draft horses. Um, they typically struggle in those pastures, they gain too much weight and obviously are at higher risk of developing digestive and metabolic disorders. So not necessarily all horses can do with this good quality grasses. So depending on what your, you know, what your um, class of horses are, if you are having race horses, high performance horses, breeding horses, young stock, you can, you want to have good quality grass. So you may want to have indeed a little bit more um, High productive pastures, but I would not suggest that that should be only uh, monoculture based. So you can have a variety of pasture species, but still have that, that good quality for meeting the dietary needs of these high performance or uh, breeding horses. Um, in in the case if you have horses that do, that are very sensitive to these type of pastures that are uh, large, high in non-structural carbohydrates, so your your simple sugars and your starch. You really want to avoid those 
um, because they can lead obviously to those digestive and metabolic disorders but it can also lead to this ineffective use of pasture so if you have seen your horse grazing or typically ponies um, they will eat the nice stuff but they leave the roughs so you want to have a um, depending on your class you want to kind of avoid one or the other or want to have a a bit of more of a balance between the two. So have good quality grasses as well as low quality grasses and that horses are grazing more evenly. And I'm going to get back to that. How do we do that? And I think that we already discussed this a little bit in the pastures pharmacy, um, how we can get more even grazing of, you know, less palatable and palatable um, pastures. But I will get back to that when we get into our pasture planning. Um, the third reason why we want to have pastures or grass or growing grass for horses is obviously if you have the space to make conserved forages or for those farmers that um, are able to supply us with conserved forages. We also want to maintain grass cover to provide cushioning for horses to exercise on and prevent problems with concussion. Um, muddy pastures is a danger for ourselves and for the horse, so slipping, even horses can break their legs, so you want to have um, you want to have biomass on there. You want to have pasture and, uh, and pl pasture plants and root systems so that you have uh, horses have much more of a grip um, and have less problems with uh, obviously injuring themselves. But there are more reasons why we should maintain our pasture. So it's one, obviously for the health of our horse, having enough, um, uh, well, have enough roughage of uh, plant-based um, foods for our horses, it's the number one, um, that's the basis of our horse diet and then we can add concentrates and supplements to it. Um, obviously also for the conservation of the land and the environment, um, having pasture plants and healthy soils will help with water and nutrient cycling. Um, soil is the biggest um, medium and in, in, in acts like a sponge of holding water. So it's very important to take care of our soils because that increases water capacity holding capacity. We want to obviously maintain the aesthetics of a property. I think most people not only have a property so that they can have horses, I also believe that most have a property for, uh, for its lifestyle so, and for the looks. So making sure that your pastures look good um, is also important for, um, for the aesthetics. And also if you want to then sell the property on, it will be easier to, to, you know, to, sell, um, to sell your property. It looks good. You can make nice photos of it and advertise that. Obviously, having pastures reduces the input of conserved forages, decreases feed cost, and hopefully also reduces veterinarian cost. So there are some common, uh, common pasture problems and land problems that we're all facing. Even myself that is trying to do the, the right thing and have read so many um, um, so many strategies and, and try to also implement them in, in my own, on my own property and with my own horses. Obviously, um, we're not free of them. So have a look at this property. This is just a standard horse property. Um, and if you look around, you can probably identify some of the, uh, the, the, the most obvious problems. So here you have the red arrows highlighting so you can see here a bit of um, erosion this is a, a, a creek and so you can see a little bit of erosion on the on the slope so a little bit of gully erosion in near the riparian area um, you can see a little bit of overgrazing here you can clearly see here in the corners compaction and obviously um, erosion and the same here same here you can see actually clear tracks that the horses may have walked so a bit of fence walking is shown here and, and obviously uh, congregating in the, in the corners, which horses love to do. Um, there are obviously, if you look at this property, there are a couple of design, um, probably design um, um, observations that we can maybe uh, look at and make some uh, su suggestions for improvement. Um, to avoid some of this and we'll get back to that a little bit later. So let's have a closer look. So we already showed a little bit on that photo over grazing, erosion, compacted soils in the corners, um, but could also be throughout the paddock. We'll talk about that very soon. Over resting and oxidation, actually, when you leave pastures too long for resting, 
it can actually oxidize. We see that typically in arid systems. So for instance, in South Australia, where it is more arid, um, you can actually do more damage by overresting than actually introducing livestock. Um, so it's a misconception that rest is always good. It depends a little bit on the on the, the, the brittleness, as we call it, of the environment. So uh, if you have a lot of water distribution, you're in a humid system, resting is really, really helpful. But when you, um, and you can do quite a lot of resting, there's not a lot of damage. But when you do this in an arid system, you actually can get oxidation because nothing, um, nothing really happens in the soil. There's not enough water, which doesn't, um, doesn't bring in enough microorganisms and your soil workers to actually decay, so actually be able to transform your, um, your, your plant material, organic material into humus, into building soil. So that can be actually a problem. Salinity, um, water logging, as you can see in this picture, weeds, and, and if you all get this together and you also add like a manure buildup, you can actually get so-called horsic pastures. So you can see in this photo um, a buildup of, of weeds, as you can see in the middle. You can see manure buildup throughout the paddock. There's no, nobody is cleaning this paddock. They have the horses just set stock. That means they're continuously grazing in this paddock. You can see that there's a lot of trampling, some compaction, and some overgrazing. So it's a lot of problems altogether. And we also say horse sick because um, these build this buildup of manure actually can cause parasite problems or um, if it's then a very aggressive worming um, schedule, it can actually cause even resistance to the wormers, which then can lead to even more problems within the in the horse. And as you can see at this arrow with this pony, it actually is pushing its head through the through the fence to get some of the clean grass um, on the other side of the fence. So this is typically um, what we indicate as a horsic pasture. And, um, and this is, you know, obviously the, the worst of the worst. Um, and this is what we definitely need to avoid. If I then um, go back to some of my research, I, um, in 2012, 2013, I did a survey, which was not particularly only related to pasture problems. I was actually interested in browsing behavior of horses. But I also was interested to see if there was um, any relation to, you know, the pasture availability or any problems, uh, why horses may browse more or less. So when I um, interviewed um, around 400 and um, around 445 um, uh, horse owners, they indicated that um, that weeds was the highest uh, of uh, the frequency count or percentage of uh, pasture and land problems, which is almost 80%. So uh, wheat was number one. The second biggest problem that people indicated um, was overgrazing. And obviously, together, they had the highest um, a combination count. Um, uh, so overgrazing and wheat, so around 40%. Um, compaction was about um, about 40%, so 180 of the 445 uh, respondents um, indicated that they have compaction as a problem. And this is interesting because I want to delve in this a little bit deeper because I think that um, we quite confuse some of these problems and a lot of these are actually symptoms. The underlying problem is much more, um, uh, well, uh, less, less obvious for horse owners, I think. But once, you, once I um, make you aware of it, you will go, ah, and this will relate why certain things happen or not happen with your, with your pasture. So let's have a look at weeds. So weeds is just a symptom. So if you look at this horse pasture, it was also a bit of a horse sick pasture. Yeah, had a buildup of uh, thistles and some other creeping um, um, weeds. Um, but if you think about that weeds are growing, in particular thistles that have a deep taproot, the underlying, what is the actual underlying problem? It is actually compaction. Deep, deep tap roots indicate like plants that fill a niche like thistles are actually able to penetrate still very compacted soil layers to get to the deeper layers to um, draw up um, water as well as nutrients. 
So a lot of weeds are indicators, and, and I will get back to that um, later on. Symptom being waterlogged. Again, uh, water sits on top and cannot go through the deeper soil layers. So this is also an indication that the problem is actually compaction. So again, waterlogging is just a symptom. That's why it was very interesting to, um, to do this survey and see what people thought their main problems were. And obviously, I didn't, I didn't um, specify in that the severity of the problem, just if they encountered them. So um, it's not clear if it was a big problem or a small problem, but most of us deal with some form of a bit of water logging or um, weeds. Again, symptom being erosion, which means that water is running off and kind of causes this um, soil sediment um, being taken. And we see this maybe a little bit more on properties that have uh, slopes in this case. But again, the problem is compaction. Again, the, the, the water is not being able to soak up by the soil layers and kind of sits on top and can cause this type of um, erosion, as you can see here. Symptom being can't get grass to grow. I get that a lot. Um, and as you can see here, um, again, you probably see the pattern. It is actually compaction. So when the ground is compacted beyond 300 PSI or even 250 PSI, a lot of pasture plants with fine roots cannot actually grow. It just cannot penetrate to that soil. And as I said, then you get um, kind of your pioneer species like thistles and dock, um, as well as um, um, some of your other weeds that, um, that are able to actually grow in those conditions. So that's why I want to just spend a little bit of time of what is compaction, because we all have it. Like typically in our corners, as I showed on that, uh, on that uh, first picture on that horse property. Um, so a compaction occurs when a force compresses the soil and pushes air and water out, out of it so that it becomes denser. And you can see here, um, horse, obviously their hoops will have a certain impact on the soil. And the more they stay in that area, the more uh, impact and the more denser that, air, uh, that soil gets. The same thing, machinery, our cars, quad bikes, obviously, tractors, they can also um, have a um, can also compact the soil, and obviously the heavier the machinery and the heavier the animal, the deeper that effect can be. So compaction um, may um, may be more obvious, as I said, in the corners of our property, uh, of our, our pastures, so around the gates uh, where horses congregate. But compaction can be throughout the paddock, can be even in the middle of the paddock, but the degree um, may be a bit different. As I said, the, the PSI of the how much is, how the density is may, may, may be different throughout the pasture. And it may even be that you're not really aware of it, but if you will go in, into that pasture and get a spade and try to dig up some soil, we'll typically find out very quickly if you're dealing with compaction or not. If it's very hard to get your spade in, you typically are dealing with compaction. Um, if it's a bit easier, um, then you you'll find that water or uh, water and some soil organisms may be uh, present. So, how do I tell my soil is compacted? You typically find also not only that it's hard to get your spade in, but what you see is also a color change. So typically what we see is we have a topsoil layer and then we get our subsoil layers and then deeper, deeper layers. And obviously there can be, depending on where you are, the geological um, uh, um, location can actually dictate a little bit what type of soil layers you have, like a sandy, loam, um, clay. But what you see here is um, the soil, the so top layer is all stripped down and you can see that the subsoil lay, sub layer is exposed. Typically this kind of red kind of looking soil, that's what we typically account, a bit of clay deposits as well in, um, in, in, um, in Australia, throughout Australia. Um, this is, if you look at how hot this topsoil should look at, that should be at least 20 centimeters thick, if not 25 centimeters thick of nice loose soil black to brown, and it should be reasonably full of life. Obviously, in the winter, 
uh, animals are a bit more dormant, um, but you will have to, you find like fungus, you will find worms, you find um, other insert, beetles, um, other invertebrates, um, fungus, obviously. That's all important to, to find in your, in your um, soil layer. Um, that indicates that, your, that the water goes through and it indicates that oxygen uh, can, can, um, is, is available in, in, that, um, in that layer. Here you get a more anaerobic, what we say, without oxygen condition, and that can also breed very like, um, harmful bacteria and um, is not so, not so healthy. So this is kind of what you need to look at. And how does, what, does that in, what does that mean indeed? Well, I kind of already answered a lot of these um, typically on the water cycle, but um, we need to look at four ecosystem processes and we need to really be aware of those because those dictate really how we should implement some of the tools to improve and restore our pastures. If we don't understand these ecosystem processes, we never get our pasture and soil management right. So the first one we already highlighted is water. Water cycle is so important. Without water, we need blue before green before black. We need water first to grow plants that then die that can then be transferred into soil. So water. You can see here a healthy system, healthy soil layer, healthy soil and ecosystem and an unhealthy ecosystem. You can see that again, you'll find that the color is different. Um, you'll find that there is much more biomesh on um, uh, like plants, uh, plant availability in healthy soil and water can penetrate through these layers and can get um, obviously through all the roots and can be used by all the animals that live there. Um, but then it, it goes also to underground flows that then bring it to springs and rivers, which is our obviously looking at our water cycle. It's from rainfall back to our rivers, to our seas, and then it obviously evaporates, turns into rain again, and that's kind of our cycle. I think that most of you are quite aware of that in when you got biology or, um, um, or even um, at, at just even at primary school. It's a simple, very simple loop, um, but we need to be aware of it. If we have an unhealthy system, what we see is that not a lot of water can go through, as I told you, because of the compacted layers. And if you then have also high clay deposits, it, what will happen is that most of your water will run off to lakes and rivers. This is also not good because we um, can get erosion, we can get um, buildup uh, in our river systems, and if we also have used chemicals on our property, that can also um, um, have devastating effects on the pH of our water and obviously residues that may affect fish and other aquatic life even ourselves because obviously we use that for our drinking water. So very important that we understand that having biomass and healthy soil systems help us with the water cycle. And as I mentioned, soil acts like a sponge. One part of, um, one part of humans can hold four parts of water. So it's very important to, to build that soil, have a healthy soil layer. Okay, then the other cycle that we need to be aware of and we need to understand is the nutrients, obviously, which is uh, atmospheric carbon and nitrogen, which we can get from the atmosphere, um, but also from obviously the um, manure from animals, so obviously our horses. Um, if we have a healthy system with biomass um, and healthy soil, uh, what we see is that nutrients will be taken up by soil organisms and by root systems. Um, and there's not much leakage because it's really recycled by, by all the um, um, that is soil food web. But if we look at a non-healthy system, we see that plants typically struggle, like your trees and your, and your grass plants uh, will be limited. You will have these clumps. You find a lot of bare spots. And you find that the root system is not going very deep. And that's because of this, this compaction. And, um, and it, so it kind of stays quite superficial. And the water, or sorry, the nutrients typically run off, similar to water, will run off to the lakes and rivers with water. But when it rains, it just kind of uh, washes off. Or it just, if, if you don't have as much clay and it's kind of sandy, what you will get is a lot of leakage of, of uh, nitrogen um, through, um, through our soils. And that obviously ends up in our underwater 
spring. So it depends a little bit on the subsoils that you're dealing with. So it's very important that we have healthy soils for this nutrient cycle. Obviously, we want to utilize our nutrients to feed our plants, which then feeds our horses. So it's, it's again, a, a very a, not an important cycle. Okay, so the, uh, the, the third process that you need to be aware of is about community dynamics, and it depends on in which ecosystem you look at. So here we're looking at our pasture and our soil ecosystem. If we have high density of species, what we find is that the number within a population are few, but very stable. So having multiple species doing and fulfilling their role creates stable environments and can all benefit each other. We know that fungi have a symbiotic relationship with, with plants, same thing with bacteria. Think about your nitrogen-fixing bacteria that live on the roots of, um, for instance, legumes. So we know that having a variety of these um, um, species within each ecosystem, within plants and within soil food web, will help with having a healthy, stable system. But if we have an unhealthy soil uh, and pasture system, we typically see, um, um, obviously, weeds appear. And obviously, in this case, when we're dealing with compaction, a lot of thistles will happen. So we get low density of species, but high numbers. And that can then bring other diseases. So uh, what we see is that when the diversity of species goes down, we see an increase in the population of that species. And that's when we really talk about pests. But um, these thistles do play a very important role. So don't think them as bad. And we'll get back to that when we're talking about some tools for regenerating our pastures. Then the fourth and last ecosystem process that we need to be aware of is the energy flow. Obviously, to, to grow, to actually build soil, so to get the black humus that we want, to then have plants growing in it, we actually do need to grow first plants, which then are, um, which then becomes, uh, which wilt, which um, becomes decay, which then obviously feeds our soil organisms that then turn it into um, humus within soil. So we do need plants before we can get um, before we can get black before we can get soil. So benefiting from the energy flow is very important. So therefore, in the beginning, even in, it doesn't matter if you have not the right pasture species or even some weeds. Actually, utilizing that and slashing that to then create decay, uh, which then is then broken down by microorganisms, is very important. So that we really fully utilize the the, um, the energy flow so that we um, have plants that, um, that grow, that uh, use obviously the sun to multiply, to grow. Um, we can then obviously feed our horses and their manure obviously can also be returned to the soil. So it's again thinking about the energy input and energy output and that it is again a continuous, continuous loop. But we cannot get this without growing plants. And in the beginning, we may not have to, we cannot be too specific about what we're growing. Um, just have anything growing is better than nothing, even weeks. And we'll get back to that um, in, in the next uh, section. Um, we need to be aware that each of these levels obviously have some loss of, um, uh, loss of biomass at each trophic level. That's because each of these produce a little bit of heat. So, so some, it's not a full closed cycle. Energy is never, in a way, um, fully lost. But um, some is a bit lost by heat. But most is transferred into the next trophic level. So restoring and maintaining healthy pastures and soils. So as I said, I, I due to time, I have to kind of keep it to only a few uh, strategies that I want to uh, focus on. And some of them are already kind of mentioned in a lot of my workshops. So maybe for a lot of you, just a repeat on, on a lot of it. Um, but first of all, what I want to highlight is that when we think about pasture management or when um, you look at the conventional way we tend on, on large-scale farming is we tend to plow and then we sow for cropping. Um, uh, we tend to obviously spray pastures out or use fire and then we sow. But obviously this, this kind of ends up on a vicious circle of 
are being really dependent on these kind of uh, chemicals or this way of uh, farming. And that can obviously cost a lot of money. And not necessarily this is good for the soil. And I'm talking here about continuously. So each year you may have to burn the lantan or every year you may need to um, spray out some of these weeds. Um, and what we see is that the soil gets typically more poor. It creates uh, conditions for indeed weeds to come. And then herbicides are again reused. And so it becomes this vicious circle of input. And um, not to say that weed spraying cannot be used as a tool, it's just on a continuous loop it can be very uh, unhealthy for your wallet as well as for, your, for the ecosystem. But sometimes if you have really bad conditions or you're taking over a property that has been very badly managed, you may have to do that initially. But you do need to think about stepping out of this cycle and think about, well, what is more sustainable? How can I work better with ecosystems? and um, and, and work with them rather than against them and utilize that to actually create you know, those, that soil, build that soil, create the better pastures and the biodiversity that is what I like to see and is better for my horses. So we do need to think in, in, in a more sustainable way. That means that you need to think about your, obviously your inputs, um, what kind of um, issues you may encounter and obviously am I doing the right thing for the environment and obviously the horse because we all um, want to do the right thing for the horse but we should also think that if we want to do the right thing for the horse we will have to do the right thing for the land as well. So thinking about um, these three aspects is very important to work towards more sustainable um, way of um, managing our properties. So as I said, our main goal is to preserve and, and support the well-being of our horses. I think that um, we obviously enjoy uh, riding horses or just pure for the pleasure or breeding horses, obviously depending on your interests. But I think that most will be aware, most will be agreeing that we'll, we'll have to have the well-being of the horse paramount and obviously performance. And, in some systems, performance is maybe more important, um, but I don't think you can have high-performance animals without having good well-being. Uh, I know that we do it, but I think that we really need to be aware that it's connected. And obviously, as I said, we also like to maintain a property for the aesthetics, for the lifestyle. And so to do that, to do the right thing um, for horses and for our own living, I think there are multiple, multiple, um, um, well, views and uh, management aspects that we need to take in consideration to work towards that success. So we cannot only think about soil and pasture. We need to think about how we manage horses on those pastures. We may need to think about the property design. Um, obviously, integrated nutrition. It may be that you don't have enough pasture, so you do need to have supplementary feeds. Um, understanding more about plant-animal interaction to avoid toxicity problems or digestive or metabolic problems. Um, these are all important aspects that little, you know, that we need to have in our, in our toolbox to be able to manage our properties better and to do the right thing for, for our horses. And I think most of my webinars has been touching on each of these um, subjects in, in a little bit more detail. So, here again, uh, a bit of an overview that I already given in other webinars as well. Some of the tools that we can use in restoring and maintaining pastures is um, here's a selection and we'll go into more detail in each of them. So the first one, as I highlighted, that most of the symptoms that I see are, are like weeds and can't get grass to grow or erosion. Um, those are all indicators of that we have a compaction problem and I think the number one thing is that we need to decompact soils if we want to get ahead and we want to build more better you know healthier soils and grow more biodiverse pastures so first a bit about weeds a weed is a plant whose virtues have not been yet discovered so Ralph Waldo in 1878 and I think it's an interesting one because I think that we classify weeds typically as bad but as I said, in, in the beginning, we may have to actually use them because they are indicators of what is happening or not happening with your soil. 
So for instance, as I said, pixels are typically an indicator as well as docs and um, St. John's wort, for instance, it's also a weed that we don't like to see, but it, it has a, a plays a role in that environment because it's typically like soil compaction. Um, can be a pH problem. So for instance, with clover, it highlights that there is compaction as well as a low pH, um, which means that it's acidic, um, it's low, low in um, low in nitrogen, so low fertility. Um, that's why it lives there because it can use this nitrogen fixing bacteria to increase um, it uh, able to live in an environment with low fertility. And it may even um, indicate something about your about um, hydration, about water. So if it's um, uh, dry or if it's waterlogged. Same thing with dandelion, and there can be a big list of those. So weeds do tell us a story about what is happening or not happening. Typically weeds grow in acidic environments, so making your pastures more alkaline can help, but it may not solve all your problems. As I said, if you still have compaction, weeds will return because weeds, in a way, break up the soil. When they die, these roots die, and we can use that by, for instance, we can actually do that by slashing. So we can slash the plant, the root dies, and it actually becomes a pocket for water and to air to infiltrate the soils. So, and obviously those roots um, are organic matter that are now broken down um, by microorganisms and by soil workers to humans. So weeds are a natural way of compacting our soils. They just fill a niche. As I said in the beginning, you may not be too specific about what grows and actually be happy with anything and just slash, 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 slash. And over time, you can actually um, decompact your soil and you will see a change happening and you see some more pasture species um, dominating. But depending on the severity, it can be that, it's, that, that you never get to that stage because it's so compacted that you need some mechanical help. That's our other tool. So we have nature that can help us, but we still depend a bit on our mechanical by slashing. We can go step one step further, which is the so-called deep ripping technique, either a key line plow, yeoman's key line plow, or a Wallace plow. I have spoken about this in many other workshops. So this plow um, slices through the deep, yeah, these compacted layers, as you can see, they make these nice lines, but they're not cultivating, as you see. It just kind of closes the top top layer. And again, it works like a thistle, like a deep tap root. It allows water and oxygen to infiltrate. And you can even have on these plows little pipes, little uh, tubes that actually can feed in straight, um, uh, for instance, a biofertilizer or compost tea or even just the seed, the, the seed dispensers can be put on these and it can become a multi-tool. Um, but again, um, these this may not be always feasible um, because um, higher, you need to be able to hire something if you're on a smaller property. If you're on, on a bigger property, it may be a good investment. Um, and also in certain areas, it may not be possible to use a key line plow if you have a very rocky granite-based um, pastures. And this obviously won't be possible because you will damage the plow and the shanks. And you may have to resort much more to, um, to other techniques. So what does a key line plow do? You can make these actual patterns even to um, not only deep rip and infiltrate water and, and oxygen and, and allow for oxygen to go back into the soil, but you can actually use the shape of the land to actually make these kind of key, what we call key line patterns, to bring water from the, from the wetter valleys to your drier ridges. And um, there's, as I said, a full on design um, uh, pattern for this. So the key line plow is one, and then you have the key line design, which is um, a, a separate concept that um, that you may be interested in if you're dealing with these type of dry and wet regions in your pasture. So typically on undulated, hilly properties, you, it may be an important aspect to consider if you're interested in, in this, um, this strategy. So here you can see what the key line plow does. Oh, we do it typically over three passes or more where we um, have first a shallow rip and then we go into deeper 
um, and, and we can adjust the shank to the certain, uh, certain depth. As you can see, this is the first pass, second pass, and then the third pass. And what it also allows is that roots can actually get to these deeper layers again and build organic matter. So it is water, it is oxygen, and obviously it's about um, carbon creating more organic matter, which then builds our soil. Um, there is actually a video that I'm going to um, not show on the presentation, but I'm going to give the link in our uh, follow-up email. So, as I said, not everybody are, is able to do decompaction, and some of you don't really need it because there's not so much of a compaction problem. Maybe you have only the corners uh, of your pastures that need a bit of work. So we can then think about um, mulching and uh, for adding fertilizer. Obviously, the first number one that we, we can actually utilize is um, using our property waste, which um, when we're dealing with horses, we have a lot of horse poo. And see, people typically um, will harrow that into their pastures, and that is indeed a, an option. But if you you have, if you are in an arid system, you will find that, or if it's during summer and it's very dry and you harrow, there's not enough water, you will find that the poo just sits on top and just washes away. And obviously this will end up in your river, so that's not a good idea. But if you do it during a time where you have enough water, you will find that it soaks into the soil layer and that your organisms, your soil organisms can, can break it down. Obviously dung beetles can be very useful in this instance as well. But you will find that there won't be dung beetles if you don't have healthy soils. If you, because if it's too compacted, dung beetles cannot penetrate with their little legs. They have little, um, little barbs on it. And what will happen is that the barbs will erode because it's such a hard job going through your soil. And when the, the barbs erode, they cannot dig themselves into the soil and they actually die. So that's another reason why you should compact your pastures. If you want to have dung beetles that clean up your horse pastures, of your poo, you really need to have healthy soils because they need to be able to dig down into your soil and, and, and create a burrow for their, for their eggs and for their larvae. So it is very important that you really consider, uh, reconsider harrowing. And the other um, aspect that you need to be aware of is that if the poo stays onto the pasture and it's not broken down and then you reintroduce your horses, you actually can create you can actually reintroduce them to infected poo and actually create a parasite problem again or even build resistance if you have a very aggressive um, way of, um, of worming. So it's very important that you are aware of when and when not to harrow. And if you harrow, and you, um, in, it's very important that you take the horses off and that you have enough recovery for the pastures to to, to clean that up before you return the horses. So the other option that we can do, which is a much cleaner way and causes less problems, is when we compost. So when we use our horse manure with some old hay and our kitchen scraps and actually turn that into a compost and um, fertilize it because with compost we can spread it onto pastures and because it's already broken down, if it's done in the correct way, and we actually have a, um, a full webinar on composting, so we can offer that link in our follow-up email. That if you have the, if you've done composting in the correct way, you actually can introduce it onto your pasture, and after a bit of rain, um, you can reintroduce the horses uh, much quicker because there is no problem with reinfecting parasites because you already broken down the poo to a humus, more humus-like um, material. It's also probably more healthier and you build much quicker soil. So if you can do um, composting, it's the ideal way to um, fertilize your pastures. And it's, it's a little bit of management and obviously time input, but it will be less, um, less money um, overall, unless you have to, if, unless you um, need to import it. So if you have, you know, a new project and you need to re-establish uh, your pastures, you may have to get large quantities. And obviously, unless you have a lot of horses and a big business with horses, it may be that you have to um, work with um, compost companies to be able to 
to get enough compost onto your patch to re-establish it. Mulching, so okay, so once you have your manure component or your compost, um, you can then use mulch together with mulch. You can actually, as I said, you may not have a lot of compaction problems in the in your in your pastures, but you may have these corners that you want to kind of tidy up and obviously avoid mud and, and 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 issues for the horse. So you can actually use mulching technique. So you have, for instance, a compacted corner here. You can use compost or manure in a thin layer. And then you add your organic, uh, like your old hay or your old straw, and a thin layer on top. And then you water it. And this will, um, you can actually add some pasture seeds if you wanted to. But typically, you find that the pasture comes through in, under the right conditions. So if, the, if it's during the, the spring time or in, in summer, uh, when there's enough water, or you can even irrigate your water, uh, ir irrigate uh, the pastures, or during the late summer, going into autumn, um, where you get still that sunlight and you can still get that growth. So that's another technique that you can use. You can even, um, to improve it, you can actually deep rip this, this area, just to help with breaking down those compacted layers. You can see here that fence walking and the corners that, that horses may, may do. Um, and as I said, you can add some extra pasture seeds to, to maybe um, fast track some of the, um, some of the growth. Um, with, the, um, with the manure, um, it's important that, again, um, if you use manure, that you not reintroduce those horses into this area till it's all cleaned up and you have a new top layer. So make sure that if you um, if you do this type of mulching that you, uh, with manure, that you just have enough time uh, for uh, breaking this down before reintroducing horses. At the same time, you don't want to really reintroduce horses because they, they obviously cause compaction. So as you can see here, this is an area that was used for cell grazing with mobile fencing. So you can choose not, you know, kind of sh uh, shift the, the line a little bit further so that this um, gets enough rest. And that's not always possible if you have a more set layout. But then, as I said, you may, you could, for instance, use a bit of mobile tape to fence off that corner so that it can uh, can um, recover. In um, yes, yeah, as I said, you can add some uh, more species to your pasture using deep ripping, uh, 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 introduce more uh, biodiverse pasture species uh, that you like to have in your pastures using deep ripping. Or if you have severe problems, you may have to think about um, potentially spraying or cultivating, uh, cultivating and then sowing your new pasture mixed in there. So that depends a little bit on what you're dealing with. And um, yeah, and if you, if you have the space, because you have to obviously take those horses out of those pastures. Very important, um, just again, healthy soil, healthy horses. So thinking about that whatever we do, we need to think about our water cycle. So we need water. And you may have to think about irrigation for a time being to be able to grow enough biomass that then can be used by, by soil organisms. So when it decays or when you slash it, it can then be transferred into your soil, into your um, humus-like material that then creates again a medium for our plants to grow. So it's an important, um, important cycle. So the water cycle, nutrient cycle, and community dynamics and um, our energy flow. We need to work with those. And if you if you try and follow that or do the best you can to um, to improve that based on those ecosystem processes, you you'll find um, that your soils typically and pastures will improve. Okay, so then two final things that, um, that we need to also consider is the pasture planning and property design. So just think about, um, about how we manage our pastures. Obviously, we, once we establish our pastures, we put animals on it because we want them to eat that grass for, for their nutrients. And, and we come into, we run into some problems if we mismanage it. So the first thing that we need to consider is what is overgrazing? Um, you see here two situations. Would you reckon that with these type, this number of animals in this area, are we 
having an overgrazing situation. And if we have only a few men animals, so one animal in each of these yards and these paddocks, do we um, have also? Do we also? Um, can we also encounter overgrazing? And typically, if you deal with um, your councils or with um, uh, agricultural advisors, they will talk about um, about your stocking rate. So with stocking rate, and I think there's a lot of confusion sometimes, what's the difference between stocking rate and stocking density? So a stocking rate is the amount of stock on your property that can support without causing environmental degradation and is measured in dry sheep equivalent or DSE in Australia. And office stocking is most common cause of degradation of, of indeed land holdings. Um, so depending on the amount of uh, space you have, obviously the amount of acreage you have, there is a, a set stocking rate that um, they, that the council will advise um, for you. And depending on, yeah, in the sense of depending on your situation, it may be that management practices such as stabling horses or um, past irrigation and supplementary feeding uh, may be needed and that can increase your stocking rate of your property. But you do need to think then much more about your design. So stocking rate goes kind of hand in hand, I think, typically with horses on smaller properties with design, you know, with, with correct design layouts to, to, to facilitate for that. When we talk about stocking density, it's the number of animals on a uh, space that the animals are grazing. So you can see here, we're talking about a, a high stocking density. So on a smaller space, a lot of animals. So this is what we call mob grazing or holistic uh, management cell grazing. And here we have probably much more of a continuous grazing situation. But you can see that the stocking density is low with only one animal being in that space. So stocking rate, number of animals on your property, total numbers of animals on your property that the property can hold. And then your density is how many animals in a certain space of your pasture, so on a certain area of your pasture. Very important, talking, going back actually, and talk about what is overgrazing. Do we think that overgrazing happens more here or here? And I think there's a misconception that it's always uh, people think that it has to do with the stocking density or the stocking rate. But, um, it is actually, sorry, with the stocking rate. And, and that's a misconception because research has shown that overgrazing is not necessarily related to the number of animals in a, in a, in a paddock, but it's um, more affected by the time the animals spend in the paddock, in particular exposed to the plant. So the short, so if you have these animals all together, but they're only grazed here for one day, um, they actually are not overgrazing the pasture, but having one animal in this type of setup where it's continuous grazing, but for like four or five months during summer, then we can actually get an overgrazing situation because the plant is continuously exposed to bites by horses, by, by, by the herbivore. So that's why um, we typically um, need to think about overgrazing in the time we expose the plants to our animals. And that also dictates um, how pastures recover because if we graze very aggressively and overgraze, what you will find is that plants get unhealthy because their root system gets shorter and shorter and it's much harder for these pasture plants to recover um, because it their roots are kind of degraded and just um, don't are not able to get to the deeper layers to um, bring up nutrients and water. So they typically struggle. To, and then on top of that, if you then have um, compacted soils, it gets even harder and harder. You will find that the pastures get, you know, kind of bald spots and quite clumpy. And that's when you know that the plant is struggling. So in a more healthy system, we want to avoid this very short grazing. And so we typically have a, what we call a little bit of leaf area. And that's why we need to think about pasture management much more into leaf area management. So never graze below four to five centimeters during the growing season. Why I say the growing season? During the dormant season, you can actually grow quite closer to the ground because the plant is not actively um, utilizing um, 
its energy for growth, but more for survival. So it already is a bit in um, kind of in a dormant phase. But you still want to obviously avoid uh, continuous grazing. But definitely during the growing season, you need to be very cautious of allowing enough leaf area so that the plant has enough um, surface to capture the energy, yeah? think about the energy flow, and then obviously to have enough root, healthy root system to take up the nutrients and water from the soil to become a healthy plant again, to have enough biomass that then we can put horses back on or cattle. So thinking about leaf area management, there are a number of ways how we can grace and manage our animals. So we already talked about continuous management. So stack stock, stack, set stock grazing is when we leave an animal in there pretty much for a whole year round and we're not changing it. Um, or, you know, we maybe have only two paddocks and we just um, rotate the year through that and the pastures don't get enough rest. Rotational grazing is where we have larger paddocks, um, but we do move the animals. Strip grazing is where we have large paddocks, but we move typically um, hot wire, um, electric fence a little bit forward so that we offer a new little strip of, of uh, pasture. Advanced cell grazing is where we kind of get into a holistic management grazing where we have smaller paddocks but even or potentially also laneways where we can um, uh, have shorter grazing moments but with higher density. So that's what you saw in that first picture where you saw those cattle in one cell but they were only there for one day and then they were moved to the next cell. And then obviously to also manage our leave area we can think about sacrifice areas or central point systems and on smaller properties that may be a necessity. So a lot may be aware of rotational grazing um, and I think that's probably more suitable for our horses. Cell grazing is possible but We'll, most people find it hard to have horses in a small area because horses tend to like to run, have a little bit more space compared to cattle. So rotational grazing may be more preferred, which means that we do have larger paddocks, but that we still um, allow for enough um, recovery, which means we have multiple paddocks and move animals through those throughout the year. So large paddocks are broken into sections and uh, livestock or horses are moved between paddocks when 50 to 70 percent cover has been removed. So again, it's about also thinking about the height. So don't go below four, and, uh, four to five centimeter with temperate pastures. And when you're dealing with tropical pastures, you cannot go below nine, 10 centimeters because they're a bit more susceptible to, um, to overgrazing. Uh, so when we wrote Rotate paddocks are not currently being grazed, they are left for rest for a period of 25 to 30 days. It can even be more depending on how many cells or how many paddocks you have and, um, and if you want to do some development on the pasture as well. And this allows plants to come back to, graze, uh, to grazing heights and develop deeper root systems as I already highlighted. It's all about the plant, this, this, um, this uh, management. Um, Increasing, obviously, by cell grazing or by rotational grazing, sorry, we increase the yield of our pasture and um, hopefully in that way reduce some of our conserved forage um, input. But as horse owners, depending on the size, we may still be reliant on it. Um, and, but finally, the most important thing as well is that it is also healthier for animals because in that way the system can clean up their manure or you can use the manure to compost but in that way, the animal is not exposed to its own manure continuously like we saw in that picture with the horse sick pasture, which can cause you know, more parasite problems, which, is, which means that we can be less dependent on these, um, less dependent on wormers or medication. So um, even though this example is more in livestock, it works in a similar way for our, for our horses. And I promise I, will, I have to make a nice diagram like this for horses. And then finally, as I said, we cannot um, probably be successful with horse properties without thinking about our design suggestions. So already highlighted, um, if we want to do rotational grazing or even cell grazing, we need to subdivide our pastures. So 
making smaller paddocks um, and obviously uh, using fencing uh, and that depends on if you're happy to use mobile fencing. I typically advise that uh, initially to get a feel for what works and doesn't work before you start to implement your more permanent systems. Um, it may be something that you know um, people may have preferences for, also from the aesthetics, may some people like white fencing, other people may like um, uh, don't mind um, electric tape. So it really depends on some of your preferences and the style of you know of your property. But no, more more importantly is that whatever you choose, make sure that it's um, safe for horses. Um, design suggestions to have design um, apl uh, like apply um, designs in your property may also not only um, is not only important for you know, recovering uh, pasture and having enough pasture availability throughout the year. But it's also very important for soil conservation to be able to take horses off pastures when it's very wet. And obviously, this may depend on where you live. When I visited the US in, in the north in, in Washington state, which um, with, with, um, near Seattle, a lot of rainfall throughout the year. And people really need to implement a special design um, um, uh, cent central point systems or, or, or loafing areas where animals can be taken off the pasture because it typically turns out to be like this. Even if they have good soil, it gets so much rain that the soil is just saturated so it cannot really take up any more, um, any more water. So obviously we can get in those situations and um, yeah, you may need to do some additional planning. Um, you may have the opposite. You may have um, good pastures and actually two good pastures and uh, you may deal with horses that are sugar sensitive. So you may have to take these horses off pasture as well at certain times, typically in spring and autumn. So what can we do? We already addressed this in many webinars, I think, and I think there's some special workshops on this as well, um, where we can have central point systems or grass fee areas. Um, where you can implement laneways. That's not for everybody. It depends a bit on the on your management, on the group of horses. Um, how, yeah, how you use your horses and with sporting and um, the dynamics. If you're having mares, a stallion, so it depends a little bit if if that if that is that works for you. Again, these are tools, and not every tool may be be useful for you or can be applied in your situation. Um, but you can see here uh, a very nice design um, with a group housing where horses are taken off pasture. Have a, and it's very important, you can see, they have a special footing to keep their, their feet dry. They have actually um, two types. They have one around the feeding area, and then they have um, another one where they kind of loaf and can lay, can lay in. Um, there's Jamie Jackson Paddock Paradise concept. Um, we already discussed many, um, many webinars that if you, do, um, if you do take these horses off pasture, obviously um, horses are designed to eat almost on a continuous basis, so we need to supply them with enough roughage. So these slow feeding systems are very important to, to include or having enough or even app lip uh, hay, like big hay bales, and that the horse can just munch on it uh, throughout the day. As I said, footing is very important in these areas because otherwise, if you take the horses off pasture and you just put them in an area which has no footing and is just um, like soil, you will get still a muddy situation, which is dangerous for you, dangerous for the horse, not good for the food, uh, feed health. So it's important that you keep the feed high and dry and that you kind of come up with a, uh, a situ yeah, like a design such as here, where you can see that just around the feeding, uh, feeding area, there is um, like a pea rock um, that it's, it's only in that area, so you can see that they have um, wooden beams just to hold the, the pea rock in. But in that way, the horse can, can <coughs> hang, around the, um, hang around the food without trampling and causing like a mud, mud situation. Um, you can go one step further. You can look into like what we call geo hacks. It's a, a very fancy um, uh, 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 um, material where we can either it's in rolls or in tiles and we can actually lay that out and then fill it with like a gravel or sand and it really uh, prevents erosion so it's kind of that erosion control 
um, well, tool, and it's, um, it's, it's a bit more expensive, but um, it will help with you know, keeping, keeping that footing in, in the area that you want to. So it, it can be a really good investment, particularly if you're dealing with um, a lot of horses. Um, and as I said, you just have to avoid uh, runoff by cladding or using sleepers, as you can see in this example. And make sure that you do have a vegetation buffer or a little swale that can help with if water if it fills with water that um, that it can go somewhere and can be soaked into either into like a, a rain garden or as I said in a swale. Here an example of laneway systems and paddocks again may not be for everybody um, as you can see here um, a laneway but there is a bit of erosion happening um, so some footing could could be useful in these areas or um, some design, extra design um, uh, additions can be made to avoid some of the runoff using sleepers. Um, but obviously, that is an extra investment. Um, the, the owner really tried to you know, manage the pasture and just sacrifices the laneway and then has a central point, which had a special footing. So you know, it's a bit of a compromise. So depending, obviously, on the budget, and it needs to be manageable as well. So the idea is, is with the laneway that you could potentially connect and then have these pasture cells and you could open certain and close others. But again, it depends a bit on the dynamics of your population. If you're dealing with much more smaller, if you have a much smaller property, um, you can indeed um, look into these um, paddock designs, so the paddock paradise design, where you have laneways, a laneway going around your paddocks and again, opening uh, certain and have a central point with your hay or feeding stations um, everywhere. We can have like your slow feeding hay nets or you can have even introduce some browse, so some, some branches of trees and shrubs. Um, you can, you know, in America they're really keen on these ideas, on these designs. Um, they have water causeways and um, they have these <laughs> these uh, bridges, um, obviously I don't know if they are really um, very cost effective if you're dealing with 17 hand horses, but um, yeah, you can make it as, as uh, fun and um, as possible and, and enrich as much as you can, but obviously that depends a bit on your budget and willingness to um, spend, uh, you know, spend money and time on, on building it. Here you can see um, a track uh, with the full geohex, so as I said, great solution, but can be a bit bit pricey. So are there many other design suggestions? So if you're really interested in getting ideas, um, go online. There's a lot of you know different people that um, that will um, that give you their example. Um, but again it will depend a little bit on, on what works for you. So finally just in summary, um, again these were just only four main points and, and tools and um, principles that I highlighted how we can improve damaged pastures and soils. Um, but we need, as I said, to really tackle those problems. We need to um, think holistically. We need to also think about our feeding. We may need to think about the, the supplementary feeding component. If we're having horses in these sacrifice areas, hay may not be enough. Um, you may have to add some vitamins and minerals depending on what you're doing with your horse, what kind of class of horse you have, um, and um, yeah, more information about how plants and animals interact, which can help us with avoiding toxicity problems such as um, such as what fireweed and uh, and uh, um, Patterson curse and things like that. And we already discussed that in one of our previous um, webinars on weed management. So, but all of these. Um, all of these knowledge and tools will obviously help us with trying to to support and maintain as best as we can the well-being of our horses. And I think that goes hands in hand with them improving their performance as well and um, and sustains our lifestyle. So that's it. And for more information, I talk uh, much more about key line design and key line planning and um, pasture management in booklet that you can get online. And for more events, you can visit the Horse SA website or Facebook page for more updates on the event. Thank you very much.